Right, hi guys, welcome, welcome to a quick revision session of Seamus Heaney's follow-up. Um, just before we start, some quick autobiographical information, some things you might need to know. Um, he's a very, very famous poet, obviously he died quite recently. This is quite a, a close poem to him. He ties in quite closely autobiographically. His own father was a farmer, and he was one of nine children who grew up in rural Ireland. So for him, this poem about a person looking at their father, who's mowing the land, who's doing everything so exactly, is very, very close to home. If we look at the meaning, the meaning of the poem is quite, is, is on two levels, basically. Simplistically, on a very, very basic level, it could just be someone looking at their father, admiring him, looking at how well he does everything. But on a more kind of deeper level, looking at the importance of the title, follow up. It could be looking at the importance of identity, of the fact that you shouldn't just be following someone, you shouldn't just be doing what everyone else does. Maybe the idea that you have to construct your own identity and don't just follow what everyone else does. Right, when the first stanza starts, we get an immediate sense of who the persona is. The words, my father, instantly tell us that the person who's going to be the, the persona in the story is going to be the son. My father worked, worked with the horse flat, his shoulders glowed like a full sail strung. Instantly, this simile, this alliteration of like a full sail strung, it draws attention to his physical size, his strength and his ability to move this plough. Between the shafts and the furrow, the horse strained at its clicking tongue. So this onomatopoeia clicking and the way that the horse strains, it creates a really clear picture in our mind of what this scene must look like. The language is quite admiring, and it shows his father straight away as someone who is in control. He paints a really, really dominant picture of his father of someone who is in control of a kind of team of horses. Okay, and in Santa 2 we get more information about how the father perfectly manoeuvres this plough, this team of horses, through the fields and does his work really, really well. The seizure right at the very, very start of the line, an expert, full stop. It brings the pace of the line to an immediate halt and emphasises the emotive imagination he has for his father, the fact that he is the very, very pinnacle of his being. The way that the son looks at his father like the perfect example of a farmer. As he goes on, this sense is developed even further. The way that he moves through the, the ground and the sod rolls over without breaking. So he's kind of churning up the ground, but it moves over without, break, without breaking. So the tone of it is quite appreciative, it's quite admiring, and again he's trying to uh, kind of promote his father as this kind of heroic being. If you look at the last line, at Hedrick with a single pluck. Look at the language, look at how aesthetic, look how beautiful, look how admiring the language is. And it really romantically describes his father and the way that he does this kind of day in, day out, but he does it so, so well. And this admiring tone really permeates through into stanza three as well. If you have a look about how the horse is described, they're described as a sweating team. So this metaphor really draws attention to the unison, the way that his father can unite his horses together and get them to do exactly what he wants. <clears throat> Looking back at the land, his eye narrowed and angled at the ground. All of these adjectives, all these words used to describe him, are so precise and so and they're in such close detail. But again, we're trying to see how good he is at his job. And look at how he maps the furrow. And he doesn't just map it, he maps it exactly. Okay, so in Santa 3, we get an even more developed sense of how good his father is. His awe, his admiration for the way his father acts.
And as we move to stanza four, we finally get an introduction of the persona. We actually get some information about them. I stumbled in this hot day awake. So you get a real contrast between the father, who's so detailed, so perfectly, so accurate, everything, and then the son, who stumbles, he's clumsy, he's dramatic. So the persona introduces himself for the first time. And the way that he's stumbling could be quite important because it could have two, quite two meanings. Simplistically, he could just be falling over. But also, if we look at it, we could be talking about how he stumbles. He doesn't live up to his father's expectations. He fell sometimes on the polished sod. Sometimes he broke me on his back. So again, look at the language. It's really quite affectionate, it's aesthetic, it's pleasant. Okay? He's quite admiring for his dad and he feels really, really close to him. The very, very last line, dipping and rising to his plot, it's quite interesting how the rhythm, the length of the words, kind of reenacts the movement of ploughing, going back and forth, back and forth. Right, in the fifth stanza we get this more pronounced sense of how this persona wants to emulate how his father, how he wants to kind of reenact the same things that he does. Look at the first line. I wanted to grow up and plow, straight away that, that instant sense of trying to emulate, trying to mimic his father. It also kind of comes across as, as quite enthusiastic. When you're younger, when you're a child, you're always wanting to try and aspire to be like your father. To close one eye, stiffen my arm. This mimicking, this mirroring of the same imagery of narrowing his eye, of stiffening his arm, just like his dad, demonstrates his desire to try and imitate him. Okay? He's always trying to be like his dad. However, as the last two lines indicate, he always falls short. All I ever did was follow in this broad shadow around the farm. So this is quite kind of bitter. It could come across as quite resentful. The idea that he never has a chance to really be himself or to live up to his dad's expectations, that he's always falling short. Notice the reference to actually the actual title, All I Ever Did Was Follow. Okay? This really professes the sense of having of no identity. He has no individuality. He just does what his father's done and he follows in his footsteps. Okay, in the sixth and final stanza, we see quite an interesting role reversal, a change in tone which indicates the difference between past and present. You'll notice in the first line he says that I was a nuisance, tripping, falling, yapping always, but today it's my father who keeps stumbling behind me. So again, we're seeing what he used to be like in the past. He's young, he's immature, and he's very, very enthusiastic, but he's not very good. He's a nuisance, he's tripping, he's falling, he's stumbling, he's yapping, he's talking, he's trying to aspire to be like his father. But, today it is my father who keeps stumbling. Okay, notice again this is you're in the middle of the line, breaking it up, indicating the transition between the past, him being a nuisance, tripping, falling, yapping, and the present. His father, who is the one who keeps stumbling. It's quite important that actually here, he has intentionally used exactly the same word to describe the father as he did the son earlier on. The father who keeps stumbling behind me and will not go away. Now by the end, the tone is quite sad, it's quite depressing. It's looking at how he's fallen from this hero type figure, this person who he always used to aspire to when he was younger, down to this quite pathetic person who, who will not go away. It sounds quite depressing and maybe even a little bit annoyed. Perhaps this could be a comment on the fact that when he was younger, aspiring to be like his father, he didn't have this identity. He just followed because that was what he was told to do. But now, now that he's realised his father isn't as good anymore, maybe he's seen the holes in his personality. Maybe he's seen, as you grow older, the problems that he has. He's changed. He's changed his perspective. So it's quite an interesting poem. It's a poem about the transition of time, the transition of perspective, and the importance of identity. Right, when we look at the structure of the poem, although the, the ending of the poem is quite sad, the structure actually does highlight some quite positive points. 
The structure of the poem is quite cyclical. It starts and ends the same way. So what I mean by this is, at the very, very start, it's the father who's looking after the son. It's him who's caring for the family. By the end, it's kind of reciprocated. This time, it's the son looking after the father. So you get the sense of mutual affection, of, of caring for each other, and of domesticity. You look at the amount of love, the admiration, and the affection present in the, in the son's description of the father. And it's quite interesting to see how people look at their father, their parents, when they're younger. The rhyme scheme, on the whole, is, is predominantly alternate rhyme. So it's A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. And what we see is how it kind of um, immaculately kind of evolves this description, this movement of the plough. So just how the plough moves backwards and forwards, so does the rhyme scheme. It kind of alternates between one and the other. The first three stanzas focus on the father, but then after that point it tends to change slightly more towards the son, the persona, looking at how he looks at things. Okay, so it's quite a good poem. I quite enjoyed it and I hope you did too. Thank you very much.